Hey friends, Steve Barr here. I want to talk to you today about the purpose of the church. Um, a good question to ask yourself is why are we here today? Why would I watch a video? Why would I gather together with people to watch a video? We're very busy people these days. There's a lot to do. Uh, why do we go to church meetings? Why do we study the Bible? Why do we pray? Uh, actually, why do we do all kinds of stuff we do as uh, Christians? And so I'm going to share with you some stuff that's been on my heart, uh, actually for quite a few years. And uh, I've come up with six things, six reasons for the purpose of the church. And if you were studying uh, this uh, subject, you might come up with eight purposes for the church or a hundred or three or however you'd like to categorize it. But uh, for simplicity's sake today, um, I'm not saying this is the pattern, but it's it's one that, that works for me and I see it in scripture and um, it's not all inclusive, but it is a, a good big picture of why we're here. And so uh, that's that's why we're spending a few minutes here on the purpose of the church. Why are we doing everything that we do? What is the reason that we're here? Why didn't Jesus just take us to heaven uh, the moment that we got saved? Uh, it would be so much easier sometimes we think that uh, if he just took us to heaven. But there's a reason he left us here on the earth. And we are a part of the church. We're not it as a church, we're, as a local church. We're not it as the church. We're part of what Jesus is doing around the world. Uh, no one church has it all. No one person has it all in the church. But together, we can work together toward a common goal. So I would say that the first uh, thing uh, about uh, the purpose of the church is that Jesus is actually preparing a bride. Someday we are going to meet him. The church is compared uh, as a bride in scripture, it's compared to a lot of things, uh, an army, a building, a sheepfold, a government, a family, and all, you know, all kinds of things the church is compared to. That's because no one illustration covers the whole church. Uh, it's just one aspect of the church and gives us, uh, you know, a, a picture of part of what the church does and what the church is. And so uh, I would say one of the big things that we or the top thing that that we are here for as a church is that we are being prepared as a bride. Uh, and Jesus is the bridegroom. There's an analogy there, a beautiful picture. And guys, you have to like, you know, put your a man card in your back pocket for a while. We can be a bride uh, uh, of Christ. It's just a picture of that. And uh uh, the girls have a lot of times they'll read through scripture and say, uh, you know, unto all men or, you know, those kind of things. So we we work together on those things. It's not a big issue. Uh, but I want to read out of Revelation 21 and 22, just a picture of what is to come. Um, the first two chapters of Genesis and the last two chapters of Revelation are sort of the bookends of scripture. And in those four chapters, there's no effect of sin. There's no effect of, of, of the sinful condition of man. It's all the in-between. That's where we live right now. Uh, we, we just live in this, this middle time of human history uh, where sin has its effect. So when we see Jesus in eternity, things will be different. We'll see things more clearly. So Revelation 21 then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the old heaven and old earth had disappeared. And this uh, sea uh, coming down from God like, like heaven, like a bride uh, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne. Look, God's home is with is now among his people. He'll live among them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and they will be his people and he will be with them and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. These things are gone forever. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, come with me, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. That's us, the church. So he took me in the spirit to a great high mountain and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It showed with the glory of God. There's such vivid imagery here. Then the angel showed me, uh, chapter 22, verse one, the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the street uh, uh, grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit. 
with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse on anything for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there and his servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads and there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them. They will reign forever and ever. So down in verse 13, uh, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Uh, the first and the last, blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit of the tree of life. And so uh, down in verse 17, the spirit and the bride say, come, let anyone who hears this say, come, let anyone who is thirsty come, let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. It's such a broad invitation to come to Jesus. Uh, that his arms are open wide for people to receive him. And I solemnly declare to everyone who hears the words of prophecy written in this book, if anyone adds anything to what is written here, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. If anyone removes any of the words from this book of prophecy, God will remove that person's share in the tree of life and the holy city that are described in the tree of life. And, and, and it says, he who is the faithful witness to all these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's the last prayer in the Bible. And we say that, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's holy people. And so that's the end of Revelation, the end of the Bible. We get a glimpse into eternity. So Jesus is coming back soon. So I would say the purpose of the church, number one, is to prepare the bride uh, to uh, come together with the groom. Uh, 2 Corinthians eleven two says, For I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. So the church has, has a husband, Christ. Revelation nineteen seven. Let us rejoice and be glad. Give honor to him for the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And his bride has prepared herself. Now that's a big, huge um, job. How can, how can one church, how can one church fulfill that and get the whole world ready for Jesus' return. Well, we could break it down a little bit because Jesus kind of gave us some instructions right before he left. In uh, Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What a great verse that is. We call this the Great Commission, uh, making disciples. The word disciple has its roots in the word discipline. It's a discipline uh, that we... Um, get to know God and to love God, to honor his word, uh, to fellowship with each other, to share our faith. These are disciples of Jesus, and it takes discipline to do those things. Uh, so our job is not to make converts. Yes, we tell people about Jesus, but our job is to make disciples, uh, followers of Jesus that will then tell other people about Jesus. And uh, our job is to baptize them in the name, singular, uh, of the Father, Son, and Spirit, plural. This is a good verse also for the Trinity. One God, eternally existent in three persons. And uh, that's, that's our job. Uh, baptism, baptizo is the Greek word there. That means to immerse, uh, to fully immerse uh, under water. And so how does one church disciple the nations? Well, uh, we have to break it down further. So we come to point number three. The purpose of the church is to plant New Testament churches everywhere. We see that pattern in Scripture. Um, you know, McDonald's became the biggest uh, restaurant in the world, not because it had one gigantic counter with 10,000 uh, cashiers there. And the second you give your order, bloop, it comes out, and they serve thousands and thousands and thousands of people every day. No, McDonald's became the biggest restaurant in the world because they put in McDonald's seemingly on every corner in big cities, uh, but in every village and hamlet and town around the world. Um, and so we see that pattern in, in the New Testament as well. Um, and we see churches in Antioch, Asia, Babylon, Cancrea, Caesarea, Cilicia, Corinth, Ephesus, Galatia, Galilee, Jerusalem, Joppa, Judea, Laodicea, Pergamos, Philadelphia, Samaria, Sardis, Smyrna, Syria, Thessalonica, and Thyatira, to name a few. And nowhere in the New Testament does it mention the Apostle Paul Ministries Incorporated. All believers did was they went into different localities and, and uh, planted or started local gatherings of believers and formed them into collections, the ecclesia, the called out ones, collections of local churches where you have 
the word being preached, where you have prayer, where you have communion or the Lord's Supper celebrated regularly, where you have leadership in place, elders and deacons and so forth. Uh, we see that pattern uh, all through the New Testament. We don't see anything else. We don't see any parachurch organizations. I'm not against them per se. We don't see them in scripture. And God's pattern was uh, to plant authentic New Testament churches uh, everywhere, everywhere. And so that's the only New Testament pattern. So then how do you do that? How does one church um, plant New Testament uh, uh, churches everywhere? Well, one church can do number four, uh, uh, equip, train, and release leaders. And uh, we see that all through scripture that we are to multiply ourselves, to train and equip the saints for work of service. Out of that will arise leaders in the local church. Now, on on two respects, we are leaders. One is every believer is a leader. Jesus said to be salt and light in this world. How could you be examples to the world unless you had take on a leadership mentality or role and to be examples to the world? So in that respect, every believer is a leader. Uh, but they're not all leaders in the local church. There's many people with leadership abilities in the local church that might lead businesses or work in education or the arts or, or medicine or politics or any number of, of areas with leadership. God has called them, gifted them for leadership in those arenas. Some God has gifted and called for leadership in the local church. They're not any better than anybody else. It's their role. It's what God's called them to and equipped them for. We see two offices uh, in the New Testament, we see elders and deacons, uh, but we are always uh, training for leaders and to see what God has called. Um, and leadership means by example in every area. Uh, leaders are examples. It's godly, servant-hearted leadership uh, that are being raised up and equipped and trained. And so every leader uh, I tell uh, my leaders that they have in one hand a bucket of water and the other hand a bucket of gasoline and there's lots of sparks. The devil sure would like to divide us uh, from time to time, if not always. And every leader can either throw water on a spark or they can throw gasoline on a spark and make it way worse. So leaders are examples and people watch your example. They follow you. And uh, the church needs leaders in every area, in every arena, and we also need leaders in the local church. And so our job as a church is to equip and train and release leaders. So how do we get uh, leaderships equipped and trained and released if we don't have in the church a kingdom of priests? Number five, our job is to, as a local church, to raise up a kingdom of priests. Uh, the Bible says that we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a priest represents uh, God to the world, and we represent uh, a Jesus in our sphere of influence. Everybody doing the work of ministry. It's not a cruise ship that we're on, the, this thing called the church. It's not a cruise ship. I've been on a cruise ship. I like cruise ships. I like uh, paying my money and sitting on a, a chair on the deck and sipping iced tea and having somebody come along and give me hors d'oeuvres. That's all fun and well. Uh, but the church is a battleship where everybody, when the siren goes, when the alarm sounds, everybody runs uh, to their battle stations. They might be a cook or they might be a barber or they might work in the office, uh, uh, any part of the ship. But when the sound alarms, they all run to battle stations and everybody has a job to do. And so every believer has a job to do. And that is to minister to serve. And that's the best team uh, in the church. It's the A team, so to speak. My friend Dudley used to say that. It's the A team. Uh, the, the main team in the church are the saints, equipping the saints for the work of service. And, and every believer can pray for the sick. Every believer can go to hospitals and lay hands on, on people who desperately need ministry. Every believer can share their faith. Every, every believer can open their home and be hospitable and invite people in and share the love of Jesus through a meal or, or an evening together. Uh, every believer can minister. Every believer can serve uh, in some capacity in the church. That's a kingdom of priests, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, now these are the gifts God gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and the teachers. Their responsibility, the fivefold ministry in Ephesians 4, their responsibility is to equip the saints 
to do works of service. Or the New Living Translation says to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. So it's not the fivefold ministry's job uh, to do the work in the church, to teach and to pastor and to evangelize and, and, and those kind of things. Their job is to equip the saints uh, to do the works of service. Now, just a little side note, the Ephesians 4, fivefold ministry, they're also saints. So yes, they have jobs in the local church and they do their part locally as well. But a translocal ministry, they come into local churches and equip the saints for the works of service. Now, how do you raise up a kingdom of priests if you don't have anybody who's saved, if you don't have anybody coming to Christ? That brings us to number, uh, let's see, did I say number five was kingdom of priests? Number six is to evangelize the lost. Uh, Matthew 9, 37 to 38, he said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the fields. Folks, our job, every single believer, is to share our faith. St. Francis of Assisi said that we should share our faith at all times, in every way possible, and if necessary, use words. So I want to encourage you as a believer, uh, get your 90-second testimony or 30-second testimony or five-minute testimony. That might be all you have with somebody on an elevator or just a moment to share your testimony, share what Jesus means to you. Maybe I, uh, maybe you could do this, 90 seconds, 30 seconds on where you were before Christ, 30 seconds on how you came to Christ, and 30 seconds on how your life has been since that time. We could all do that. We could all be ready to share our faith. Yes, we demonstrate love in our spheres of influence, but we also, sometimes we got to use our words. And so leading people to Jesus is, is number six. So here's the question for us. What is the most important thing the church does? One of those six there, huh? So you could pick, take your pick there. Which one is the most important? Here's my answer. The most important thing the church does is evangelize the lost, comma, so that we can raise up a priesthood of all believers, everybody ministering, comma, so that we can equip and release leaders, comma, so that out of that arises people who will go and plant authentic New Testament churches everywhere around the world, comma, so that we will be fulfilling the great commission of going and making disciples of all nations, comma, because Jesus is coming back. So it's not just one of these things, it's all these things. So if you're preparing for a Bible study or getting your house ready for people to come over for some sort of small group, and you just go, oh, what are we doing this for? Keep the big picture in mind. This is an amazing thing. We want to tell people about Jesus. We want people to come into the community and be the priesthood of all believers. And out of that, we want people to rise up and be leaders. And out of that, people uh, going and, and, and separating themselves to plant new churches or moving to new locations because we want to disciple the nations because Jesus is coming back. He really is. So our response in this is to stay faithful and, and not turn back, but to keep our eyes fixed forward and, and looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and to continue reading our Bibles and, and continue to study our Bibles together, to continue fellowshipping together. And even more so, Hebrews uh, chapter 10 says, as the day approaches. Hebrews 10, uh, 23 to 25, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we say we have, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let's think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. I love some of the other versions that say, spur one another along toward love and good deeds. If you're a horse, you don't like the word spur, uh, but we are to encourage or prod uh, one another to uh, love and good deeds. So we, we, we say, hey guys, come on, let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Let's let's keep this thing going. Let's encourage one another. You can do it. Atta boy, come on. Let's encourage one another in the in the job that we have. 
Let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now as the day of his return is drawing near. I hope this makes some sense to you. Uh, at the, at the purpose of the church in, in a short sermon. And I love you guys. God bless you.